Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 317, featuring part two of my interview with turbine lead engineer Johnny Wood. This part of the interview, we talk about his early days, what got him into all this. We talk about his uh, work on Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons Online, some uh, cool behind the scenes information on that. Also, what he learned by uh, reverse engineering all of Richard Garriott's Ultima games uh, for his uh, classic Ultima Online. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Johnny Wood. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of your earlier projects. Uh, I was intrigued by this uh, Black Sight Area 51. I remember the Area 51 arcade game with the mm -hmm. <laughs> shooting all the all the aliens and stuff. Uh, so how did you get, I guess, was that your first, uh, first job in the games industry? Yeah, very much. Uh, when I started at Midway, and I did not work directly on the Area 51 Black Site team, I was uh, actually on uh, in a group called uh, Core Technology Group. So uh, what this group did for the most part was uh, some engineering, but mostly we took systems created by other game teams throughout all of Midway, and we integrated those into the core technology part of the engine. And those, you know, could be optionally taken. Those changes could be optionally taken by other uh, games all throughout Midway. So um, that that was pretty much my contribution to, to Black Side Era 51 was... Uh, just taking bits and pieces from other games that that were not specific to that game, but more of a generic engine type of feature, and integrating it into the core part of the engine. Must have been a little controversial to make it into a first-person shooter game, was there? I don't know if you caught any of that. I don't yeah. think so. I mean, the... Did you work with this Harvey Smith, or do you... I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little. He seems to have had some problems... <laughs> <laughs> At least uh, I was reading the Wikipedia page about the game. I'd never heard about any of this, but I guess he was. He, uh, uh, that was his last he, last game he ever did. I'm not sure that it was his last game. I, I believe he's doing some other things on. Oh, him. wait, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. So it's. But, I guess uh, that was his last game for Midway. <laughs> it's. It was definitely his last game for Midway. He he was very vocal about having to release the project. Uh, way prior to, to when it was ready. Um, I, I'm not sure what the deadline was like back then. I'm not sure how much over or uh, how much over uh, target it was, but um, the game pretty much was mandated at one point. It was like, put the game out there. And uh, of course, this happens to yeah, that's many, many, many games. This is probably story, yeah. more often than not what happens to a lot of games. The game just was not ready to be pushed out there and then uh, it was mandated uh, he was very very vocal about it and uh, I mean vocal to the point that Midway uh, and he uh, mutually agreed that they weren't for each other yeah that is it happened to Lord British a few times you know <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> same thing it's always a disaster mm -hmm. uh, and then you worked on one called wheel wheel man action adventure I saw this described as Grand Theft Auto meets Burnout. Oh, uh, digi <laughs> digitized Vin Diesel. <laughs> so. Right, and and again, my contributions. I, I was not on the game team proper uh, at this point. I was on another team called the Advanced Technology Group, and it was very much some of the same things. I was uh, taking integrations from in Unreal to go into our copy of the Unreal Engine. Um, contributions from other game teams uh just a little requests from from the game team themselves uh if they wanted something done but didn't have the manpower to do it we were the people for it um so again not a huge contribution i didn't even realize until recently that i had received credit for being in the game there are other games that i had worked on more that i'm not sure i was ever even credited on like uh there's a wrestling game called tna impact which i had done quite a 
a lot of work on uh, as far as doing the core technology integrations and things like that. Pretty sure I never received any kind of credit for that. That sucks. Is it? Does that happen often that you don't get credit for something you worked on? Um, it can, especially if you come and go at uh, at companies, uh, which I don't tend to. I've, I've actually been at Turbine for seven years now. Um, but most of the time at Turbine, I was on the game platform team. And being on that team, again, being a central part of the engine, uh, I was receiving credit you know, for every game that we had. Uh, now that I'm actually on Dungeons & Dragons Online prop proper, I'm sure that I am no longer credited on Lotro. And, you know, that, oh well. <laughs> I mean, I, I would like to still be in the credits for that game because I do love that game, but uh, oh, oh well. Yeah, I guess that was your first big big break, right? Getting uh, to work at Turbine and going to work mm -hmm. on, what do you call it, Lotro? <laughs> mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings Online. Right. You know, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm sure there's people that watch this show who have tried that game out. So how, how did this come about? This this. You know, how'd you make this transition? Uh, well, actually, Midway pretty much began closing its doors uh, internationally. Um, they filed for bankrupt. My studio in Austin, Texas was one of the first casualties of that, I believe. And I just suddenly found myself out of a job with pretty much uh, no real reason to, to stay in Texas. I was a little tired of the heat anyway, and I, I was looking to try something new. I didn't want to spend my entire life in just one place on the entire planet. So I, I reached out uh Started uh, taking a look at possibly other places. Tur for some reason, Turbine wasn't even on my radar. Um, I got a phone call pretty much out of the blue um, asking if I would be interested in interviewing. And, uh, yeah, I, I went for it. I assume you're a big fan of Tolkien. Oh, and... <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, that's comprised a, a massive part of my life, yeah. What do you think about the game? Lord of the Rings Online. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's great. I mean, um, it's certainly prior to free to play. Not not that I'm uh, anti free to play, but prior to free to play, the game was a little bit more of a chore, and I actually like that. I, I liked that if I wanted to go enter a dungeon somewhere do a quest somewhere that I might have to ride my horse a long way to get to this place. And, and I actually really liked that. Now it's free to play. If you've got the money, you don't care to, to, to ride to that place. You can just say, take me there. It'll cost you a mithril coin, but uh, it'll work you right to that location and you can play. And I, I, I just kind of like uh, the immersive part of, you know, being in the world, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having to, run past some people maybe you're not tough enough to uh, dispose of, you know, you have to take your chances, get through those people. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I think you're right. I mean, something like that, it takes you out of the moment and you, you sort mm -hmm. of confronted with, yeah, this is a game and yes, they're trying to, you know, make money with this and, <laughs> you know, it can get, it can be kind of hard to get back into the mood, I guess, after mm -hmm. one of those breaks, but uh, it sounds like it was great for them, though, this switch to free-to-play. I read yeah, somewhere where this is the still, the, I think, maybe the third most, maybe even the second, I forget, a second or third most uh, successful uh, game at this point. Mm -hmm. MMO, yes. Yeah. It was the second or third? I, you probably know better, this better than I. Uh, I knew numbers better once upon a time, but I, I would say it, it has definitely been within the top three at some point, yes. I'm sure all those movies probably helped out. Huh. They they did. I'm not sure about the Hobbit so much, but uh, yeah, the Lord of the Rings movie certainly. Uh, so then you worked on Dungeons and Dragons Online after mm -hmm. that, and I noticed that was uh, some really interesting stuff on the Wikipedia page about this game. Uh, I was going to run some of the stuff by you, see if, if you could confirm it or not. Uh, apparently, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson were both involved. I believe so. That was before my time, though. Um, Gary Gygax 
and probably even Dave Oniston, if I'm not mistaken, are uh, voiceovers. I know they did the Dun voiceovers, but I mean, do they right. do anything beyond that? Uh, I'm I'm almost certain they had some part to play. Um, I know for just about anything we do in the game, uh, we it has to be vetted and, and okay by WotC. Um, not sure how involved they were with WotC at the time, but uh, it's Wiz Wiz yeah. Wizards of the Coast, right? <laughs> right. Yes. Like all these nicknames, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so that was a. I always thought that was an interesting concept behind this. Uh, that one, because you've got it, everything is instances, right? Except for the you've got the sort of common areas, and then everything else is is an instance. Uh, pretty much, yeah. most of the public even uh, public areas even are, are instances. So how does that change the dynamic? Um. I don't think it does much. I th a lot of people may not even be aware of that. Um, I just know from working on Lord of the Rings Online versus Dungeons Dragons Online, uh, Lord of the Rings is actually physically laid out how would you, you would think it would be. So the Shire is definitely west of Bree. Uh, laid out in the game world, whereas Dungeons and Dragons Online, because everything is instanced, uh, when you pull up the map to work on the game, it's basically just a giant grid of instances. And if you know the the market is, is south of you know some other area that you're familiar with or whatever, that's not necessarily really where it exists in the game. And I'm sure a lot of some players are aware of that because you can do. A, uh, a command in the game called a whack, whack location, whack loc, uh, and get your coordinates in the world. And they, I'm sure some players have noticed that they'll do a whack loc in one place, walk south a couple of blocks, slam blocks, and uh, do another whack loc and, and realize they're in a completely different part of the world from that. But it doesn't really affect gameplay very much that I'm aware of anyway. So I don't know if you caught that headline recently about uh, World of Warcraft and Blizzard, about how they're, they're no longer going to be reporting on the number of players. <laughs> I did, I did. So what do you think, does that, you know, as an MMO kind of guy, what is this, um, is this a significant thing? Or is it... The only thing that spoke to me was that perhaps uh, they don't quite want to publish the, the decline of the interest in the game, and... Uh... I understand uh, it's MMOs have certainly kind of fallen out of favor, uh, maybe temporarily, I don't know, but uh, players seem a little more interested in mobile projects right now. Um, like League of Legends being the... Yeah, the MOBAs. MOBA. Um, we, we actually do after work. Uh, the, the group of us who work on Dungeons Dragons Online, we have a, uh, once a week, we play our game after work together. Well, that's a nice tradition. Yeah. It, it's actually something we just recently started, but uh, it, it's nice. It's it's good to play the game and understand it well, because you certainly don't want to be working on a game, uh, you know, that size with a you know because i can change one little thing here and it'll break 20 other things somewhere else so it's it's you definitely got to do your homework what's that what's that new that new uh D, D online the it's not called that it's like neverwinter online mm -hmm. or something like that right yeah have you tried that one i have not actually um i i've i've heard mixed things about it some people feel like it's the greatest thing ever and uh and other players do not. I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't played it. I haven't formed an opinion. I don't know. I mean, it looked beautiful from what I saw at uh, PAX East uh, a year or two ago. I guess it's not really competition for you guys with D and D online. I it can be. Yeah. I I know that they had recently done um, some of the classic dungeons like we have started doing. Um, I don't know if you remember the the Dungeons and Dragons modules that have uh, that were produced way back with the classic D and D set. 
Um, but we have just recently gone in. We released uh, Temple of Elemental Evil. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, Temple of Elemental Evil. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they created their own version of it as well. So, yeah, there could be a conflict there. But uh, as, as far as I can tell, uh, it hasn't really affected our numbers at all. One of the things I talked about with uh, Richard Bartle, who's one of the creators of the original MUD way back in the day, uh, you know, he talks about how people start to play these games and that first they're kind of interested in the game itself, the mechanics and leveling and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but then they, what ends up happening, it becomes more of a social thing. You know, so they're logging in, they're hanging out with oh. the same people. And, yeah, certainly. I mean, you got that sort of core group that's going to stay with that game as long as those servers <laughs> are running. Oh, yeah. Uh, Definitely. And uh, I mean, especially Lord of the Rings Online, we see a ton of that. I mean, there are a lot of player events like um, uh, the first one that leaps to mind is an event called Weatherstock, where uh, thousands of people, and I, I may be wrong with that number, but uh, as many people as can be supported by the game engine, they all flock to the top of Weathertop. And they all break out their instruments and jam together. And uh, Lord of the Rings Online has a dynamic music system in it. So you can play music with other people. It'll sync up your music with them. And uh, you can form a band and play in front of others. And they just have social events like that. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff. Right, so I just got a couple. Well, really, one last thing I have to talk about here was the... Uh, 2015 Infinite Crisis game. This is a, this was a, a MOBA game, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, so you know, this is I was really surprised about this one because I, I remember the comic series pretty well. Mm -hmm. you know, it's got the super everybody's favorite superheroes in it. <laughs> it seemed like it was just going to be fantastic, but you know what? I don't think it was up for maybe uh, what a couple of months and and it's down. Uh... Well, officially it was up for a couple of months, so it had been in uh, alpha and beta modes for, I think, probably over a year. But when it was uh, officially released, the numbers just weren't there. People, There was a lot of initial interest in the game. Um, a lot of people turned out and played it. Unfortunately, they just didn't stick around. And uh, I, I, it was just a call on Turbine's part. Uh, I think they did some math and realized uh, that the interest just wasn't there. The uh, the budget wouldn't be enough to support the game long term. So it, it was a very tough decision to make because the game had actually been in production for so long. But uh, sadly, uh, they just decided to shut it down and... Uh, and they did. <laughs> I don't want to end our little thing with that that being that negative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, well, actually, I remember there were, are some other things I probably would like to talk about, uh, classic Ultima Online related. Okay. Um, you had asked previously where there's some other innovations and additions made to the game. Um, so some of the other innovations... Um, probably hitting on Ultimas 1 through 4. Um, so Ultima 1, I wasn't terribly impressed with the uh, dungeons that were in Ultima 1. They were all randomly generated. Uh, the random dungeon generation algorithm, while probably super innovative for its, its time, it just wasn't the greatest in the world. It would generate a lot of dungeons that were mostly vertical strips of hallways with some connectors in between and I just felt like something should be done there uh, and what I ended up doing was removing probably half the dungeons in Ultima 1 and populating the, the dungeons that I did keep around with uh, some actual real design dungeons with you know dungeon rooms with um, non-random monsters like uh, Dungeon Doom, for instance, if I remember correctly, it's populated towards the lower parts of the dungeon with uh, all Balrogs, Balrog-type creatures. Uh, I can't remember if they're called Balrogs or Balruns in the um, in Ultima One, but um, 
for Ultima 2, um, one of the dungeons, I believe it's the Pluto dungeon, I think it was never completed or it was just very bizarrely uh, provided, if that's the case. But you walked into the dungeon and I think it was 15 floors of just open space. Uh, nothing there. So I felt that that dungeon should really uh, receive some attention. Uh, so I went in and made it an actual dungeon, very much in the vein of all the other Ultima 2 style dungeons and towers. Uh, with Ultima 3, um, defeating Exodus is really a very single player kind of experience. Uh, so I went in and, and redesigned the way that works. I think uh, some people will, will be very pleased with what they see. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of ending for Ultima 3 uh, without being too different. Um, and then, uh, of course, we already spoke about the Ultima 4 side quests uh, that were added. Um, but, but that's it as far as uh, differences go for the, uh, the classic Ultimas. Ultima 4 sounds like that's your favorite Ultima. It, it certainly is. Um, that's the one I fell in love with initially. I mean, I really like Ultima 5 and I really like Ultima 7. Um, but... Ultima 4 was the one that I played originally, and I also felt like it was a small enough project that I could do and do quickly. I mean, the, the quickly part ended up not <laughs> to be a reality. I mean, it, it was a much larger scope than I had, you know, realized to begin with, but, uh, yeah. It's kind of interesting to think about somebody who's an Ultima fan, uh, but being so familiar with you know what what british had done in those games and finding mm -hmm. flaws and things that weren't so good and how did that affect your did that affect your sort of uh <laughs> yeah actually that that was probably my favorite experience of the whole thing was just reverse engineering all of the ultimas ripping out some of the graphics from those it was just amazing to see what was necessary back in that day to to make the game happen uh for instance ultima 2 if i'm not mistaken uh, one byte of data represented two pixels of tile information, and that includes color and uh, the position of the pixel in, in the, uh, the entire uh, tile. Uh, and uh, that, that was just uh, very interesting to, to have to do. And... Um, Gosh, if I'm not mistaken, the, in the Commodore 64, ripping that out, uh, some of that information was was not only um, multiple pixels per byte, but it was interlaced information. It was very hard to uh, to rip that information out originally because at first I was just dumping bytes of data and then a hex editor taking a look and just saying, uh, gosh, this particular pattern of ASCII looks like it's a tile and then just trying to reverse engineer that uh, from there on out, you know. Uh, there was a, a crazy couple of weeks of head scratching there for a while. Um, Did you find any secrets in there or Easter eggs? I found some, some pretty interesting things. So Ultima 2, there is a dungeon and I believe... Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to remember the actual dungeon. I think it's a Jupiter dungeon. Uh, one of the dungeons is actually a phone number. Hmm. Um, and it's uh, 713 area code, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm pretty sure that is Houston, Texas, which is where Richard Garriott would have lived at the time. So that is probably his home phone number, for all we know, at the time. Or it could have been if he had a... Uh, a storefront or an office location or something somewhere. It could have been the phone number for that. Maybe you saw I, it on a bathroom wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> could be. Uh, one of the dungeons also uh, is spells Lord You British. didn't try to call the number? <laughs> uh, no, actually I didn't. I'm sure that number has long changed uh, from here on out. Um, let's see, what else did I find? Uh I found a few bugs. Um, one of the uh, Ultima 4, or actually several of the Ultima 4 dungeon rooms 
uh, at least on the PC version, they are bugged. You can't get into them, or at least if you can get into them, you cannot transition from that room to the next. Um, mm -hmm. So I had to go in uh, and rip out that information. The, the data was actually all intact. I can't remember what prevented you from entering the room. I think it may just be that one of the... Uh, there are floor triggers in Ultima 4 where if you step on a certain location, some other walls may disappear so that you can move past them, uh, things like that. I think maybe one of the floor triggers just didn't work and you could not get into that room. And consequently, you could never get out of that dungeon, if I recall correctly, without just giving up and casting an exit spell to, to just remove you completely from the dungeon. But uh, that, that was fixed. Um, I, I found a couple of uh, typos, so those are actually uh, just uh, way more prevalent in the early Ultimas than, early, uh, than the, the later ones. Um, I think that's it. That's all that comes to mind immediately. Anyway. It sounds like you got a really good look at the way his uh, mind operates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, and actually, uh, speaking more to that, um, one thing I've always really liked about the Ultima series and, and Richard Garriott's design in particular is that he abstracts away uh, statistical information about things. Like, for instance, when you pick up a sword, you don't get statistics on that sword. Uh, you may have three different swords in all of Ultima 4. There is a, a sword. Uh, later on, you can get a two-handed sword, and then after that, there is maybe a magic sword and a mystic sword, and that's it. Uh, and that's actually one thing I really don't care too much about modern RPGs is sometimes after every single battle, mm -hmm. there may be a drop, a, you know, a weapon drop. You get a new sword, then you have to sit there and compare the statistics of one sword versus the other, and maybe even cross index into to how that may affect your with your uh, how your player statistics may have some effect on that sword as well. And sometimes you'll sit there for ten minutes trying to determine whether or not this new sword you got is better for you in some way than the one you're currently carrying. Mm -hmm. um, and I've I've found um, in some modern MMOs, for instance, and I'm sure Lotro and DDO are, are guilty of this as well, but um, some sessions, some nights you log in and it is purely just an inventory management session. You, <laughs> you will spend two hours rearranging your inventory, moving some things off to the bank, selling some items off, doing some calculations to determine whether or not, you know, this thing's better for you. And, and I, I actually really appreciate that Richard Garriott got away from some of those things. Um, I do like the abstraction, the, the whole virtue system in Ultima 4. You don't, you don't know that you've got 50 compassion points. I mean, there's nothing, there's no printout you can do. Uh, you can't look at your palm and see the number 50 written on it anywhere, you know. But in most modern MMOs, you, you have, a, you know, some type of inventory or statistic page you can look at that tells you precisely how many points you have in something. Um, uh, another thing about that is... Uh, like, for instance, uh, in Ultima 4, you may have one potion that does one thing throughout the entire game where most modern MMOs, they'll have 30 different potions. The only difference being is that this healing potion will only heal you for four points of damage. <laughs> this healing potion will heal you from eight and so on and so on up to like 800. And, and I would rather see just one potion in the game that scales to your player. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense that suddenly I, you know, ha ha, I just killed a, an orc and suddenly I, I just magically, oh, I, I have 300 hit points now and, and this potion, this potion is no longer any good because, you know, it's magical properties can no longer heal me. I, I don't like that. Like inflation and in inventory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, I always felt sorry for the guys at MMOs that get stuck with, you know, we need you to design 50,000 common items. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they they got to suck. You know, they can't be very good. Yeah. You know, that must be Actually, 
I saw a meme recently that uh, said someone or someone said, uh, oh, wow, I found a new wand. I'll save this for later. I might need it later or something like that. And then the bottom part of the meme said, finish the, finishes the game with 500 wands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But, uh, that is me. Yeah, that that's is a, me. That's, that's about how I feel when I'm playing the game. Every time I played one of those games with the potions, I'd, by the end of the game, I'd have to be selling them off because I'd be so laden with potions. Because you're always saving them. I want to save this for when I really need it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know. And as it turns out, you never really needed it. You know, you... No. Uh, well, thanks, Johnny. It's been fun. <laughs> Go check out Classic Ultima Online. You can do that. It doesn't cost you anything to try it out. Uh, you can download everything you need from ShatteredMoon.com, right? That's right. Shatteredmoon.com. So I'll put a link to that in the, in the show notes too. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a, a new retrospective and also lining up an interview with Jim Sachs, the celebrated Amiga graphics artist. So a lot of great stuff. Stay tuned for that. And let me know if you have questions, by the way, for... Uh, Mr. Sachs, be happy to uh, pass those along. And as always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you very much for your support of me and the show. It means a heck of a lot to me, guys. Thank you very much if you are a supporter. Uh, if you're not and would like to be, just go to that link in the show notes to that Patreon site. It's a beautiful little site. And uh, it's a great place for salty dogs such as yourself to share some of the booty <laughs> with uh, your good old buddy, uh, Matt. I could definitely use it to keep these episodes coming so thank you very very much all right what about that news from the matt cave not a whole lot of news this week but it's pretty cool nonetheless uh, the first item is Alt Space VR, which apparently they're trying to recreate using Oculus Rift and uh, some kind of virtual reality setup. Uh, that feeling that you get sitting around a real tabletop playing Dungeons and Dragons in uh, your garage or whatever back in the day. And it seems like they've uh, made some progress with this. Uh, I don't have an Oculus Rift, so I can't try this out or anything, but I thought I'd pass this along. I know a lot of you guys have uh, complained a lot, actually. I don't know about you, you in particular, but, but I've heard complaints from people that grew up with those tabletop games that... You know, really just the, the online things, uh, World of Warcraft, whatever, just doesn't quite capture that magic of sitting around the table. And it sounds like this uh, product might help, at least, uh, in that regard. So I'll place, post a link to that in the show notes. You can uh, read more about it. Uh, also, pretty cool. I know a lot of you are into collecting uh, old computers and also like to collect cards. Well, how about retro computer collectible cards? That's a pretty cool Kickstarter project. It's got all the great 8-bit computers on there. Uh, looks really nice. Looks like they did a really good job with these. Uh, it's got nine days. Oh, by the way, it's a Kickstarter. <laughs> They've already made their gold, though, so no fears there. But you've got a little over a week if you would like to pick up a deck of these, or pack of these cards, rather. Uh, they're $15 per pack, and they look really cool. So uh, retro computer collectible cards. I'll also have a link to that in the show notes. All right, what about the ale of the week? <laughs> oh, man, this is a really funny one. We've got the Stone Stochastic Stochasticity Project. Your father smelt of elderberries. And if you don't know that reference, you need to stay in. You need to stay in more. Watch some of those old British uh, comedy shows. Now, this is a medieval-style ale brewed, of course, with elderberries. Uh, let's see. There's no a little bit about stochasticity. We'll skip that and read the part about this bottle. Getting medieval on a long-forgotten beer from times long gone. Stochasticity, stochasticity Project Beers bravely explore lesser-trod territory. Imagine, if you will, emerging from the furthest depths of the dark, misty forest of time, holding a chalice, perhaps one of cathodically, <laughs> cathodically divine caliber, filled, uh, filled with an ale style dating back to, the, uh, to medieval England. We find ourselves carried by the gate of hooves, which, oddly, sound like someone is clacking together two empty coconut halves and happen upon a castle siege. Insults are being hurled from the walls above from... Frenchmen? 
Time to run away! After one last whack at the mighty stone castle walls with a broadsword, the discreet strategy just beyond the reach of catapulted bovines. Beer brewed with elderberries is freely shared. What strategies come from this? Trojan rabbit! A brilliant ruse they're sure to. Catapult. Word to the wise, Sir Bedivere. Don't strategize whilst drinking elderberry beer, or the constables may show up at the end of your flick. <laughs> you know, these guys, I mean, that is ingenious. It's worth buying uh, these just to get these awesome uh, write-ups. Let's see, malt varieties, two-row pale, mild ale, amber, peated, and flaked oats, English golding, and target hop varieties. <laughs> it's like the, the content of these labels is getting uh, out of control. Let's see, alcohol 10.3%, so definitely up there. Very, very strong. Anything else here? Age at cellar temperature or drink fresh. <laughs> uh, Twitter Smelderberries, that's <laughs> Stone Brewing Company. Anyway, this, uh, I'm sure this is going to be awesome, but uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Your Father Smelt of Elderberries here in the rather excellent drinking horn. And, you know, I have to admit, I've already tasted this. And it kind of had a bitterness, a weird sort of taste to it. So I'm wondering maybe my might my, my have something to do with the drinking horn. Uh, so I'm going to try just the drink this out of the glass. See if that makes any difference. But uh, uh, smell-wise, I get sort of a strawberry Nestle quick aroma from this. You know, you can definitely smell some kind of fruit. Although I'm not really sure what an elderberry uh, smells like or tastes like. I really wish I, I did, but uh, yeah, who knows what. It smells really nice. Well, let's give it a taste, though. Yeah, there's definitely some uh, some bitterness with this one. It's a pretty strong, kind of that high up uh, bitterness, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, not really something I would uh, go for. Just not a whole lot of flavor here, other than that uh, the bitterness and the aftertaste. It smells really nice, but of course, you know, you don't drink a beer for the, the, the smell of it. Yeah, you know, it's not bad, but, you know, man, I was expecting a lot more out of a Monty Python-themed ale. Uh, you know, not terrible, not great. I'm going to go uh, two out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, a little bit disappointed with this one, actually. I thought it'd be a lot better, but then again, maybe this would be great if you're an elderberry fan. I have no idea. But anyway, two out of five drinking horns on the Mad Chat scale. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotes by Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. And of course, there's many, many, many great ones. Uh, but I thought this one seemed somehow germane uh, to, to this episode. It goes something like this. A safe fairyland is untrue to all worlds. See you guys next week. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberry.